Good evening, everybody. Welcome in to the Villanova Basketball Report here on BLS. Bob Long, Tom Trainer, Kevin Long, your host this evening. And, well, a step back and a couple steps forward this week, guys. We'll talk about the Villanova Wildcats and their loss to St. John's, their loss of Eric Paschal for a couple of games due to a concussion. And we'll talk about some of our concerns as to how and why that happened. But just today. A gift given, maybe not unexpected, one of those birthday gifts. You Maybe you snuck a peek in, uh, in the door and made sure you knew what you were going to get for your birthday or for Christmas. But Javon Quinterly is coming to the main line to play basketball for Villanova out of Hudson Catholic High School, one of the top point guards in all the country, number seven rated nationally and a top 30 player in the country. He'll come to Villanova, and they expect that he will be able to play on day one and replace whether it's Brunson and Mikel Bridges or just Mikel Bridges. Clearly a great get for Villanova, and that complements Cole Swider and Brandon Slater, who had come on board earlier. Now, Kevin, we'll start with you here because this is really interesting. Javon Quinterly coming to Villanova, a guy that they've had their eyes on for years, right in their backyard. North Jersey has been a big, big area for Villanova. Uh, he originally committed to Arizona, kind of one of those things. He went out there, took one visit, all of a sudden he was committed. And then the FBI investigation came out that was before the year, right before the season started. Rick Patino was outed in this. Uh, the issues with who we surmised to be Lonnie Walker down there at Miami. Javon Quinterly was thought to be quote-unquote player five in that FBI investigation, who a recruit to Arizona who had taken a sum of money uh, from a person that was essentially pining to be his agent long-term and facilitated those financial transactions. He since decommitted, reopened the commitment. At that point, it seemed like it was going to be Villanova all along. Yeah, and Bob, I'll start off by saying, you know, this is a great find for Villanova. Uh, number 26, I believe, in the ESPN Top 100 in his class. Uh, obviously, a team here that's going to be struggling for guards, it looks like. Probably not going to retain Jalen or Mikhail at the end of the season. So, uh, great find for the Wildcats. But we were talking about this before. It's one of those things that seems to be widespread now in college basketball or all of college sports, really. Um, you know, you have boosters and future agents supporting these kids as they're coming up through high school. Um, and, and we're really just sort of wondering, you know, where this ends. You know, we just saw an investigation with Rick Pitino where his name was essentially disgraced out of college basketball, you know, a uh, Hall of Fame type coach. And uh, all of a sudden, one scandal like that and his name is totally disgraced. So um, it's really disappointing to see things like this happen constantly. Um, and it's sort of the same thing with baseball. You see steroids in baseball and the whole thing with Alex Rodriguez and Ryan Braun. Um, you know, they were all essentially ousted in that investigation, but no one would have ever found it if the guy inside the whole, um, you know, the whole whatever you want to call it, um, had, hadn't ousted the rest of his friends and the people he was working with. So, you know, it's, it's another one of those things that this may be one of, 50 cases going on in the entire country right now, and they just happen to find this one out. This is probably going on all over the place, which is really a shame because, you know, the game of college basketball seems so pure, and these kids are just playing for the love of the game and playing with a lot of heart out there. But really, what's going on behind the scenes is disappointing. Man, I, it's funny. I, we agree on a lot of things. I agree with very little of what you just said. One, Rick Pitino, one scandal, and his name <laughs> is disgraced. I think there's been a couple other things that he's done. Uh, sure. And unfortunately, I, I don't know that we look at the college basketball game right now as pure and, and exactly how you want the game to be, because I think this has been happening for a long, long time. Uh, it, it truly has, and I think now it's more public knowledge than it ever has been. I mean, I'm kind of kidding about disagreeing with everything you're saying, but I, I think that I think that to some extent we all actually saw this coming. What do you think, Tom? Well. Yes, recruiting in college athletics has been tainted for a long time, probably since the 70s, 60s, since whenever universities realized that they could make a lot of money off of college athletics and that doing so required getting superstar recruits and how you're going to get superstar recruits and all of these programs are competing against one another. 
sometimes just like unfortunately in anything in life it seems you have to bend the rules uh to, you know to get your foot in the door and but what has really propelled it recently has been the growth of AAU uh in all sports but then you know amateur athletics used to be amateur athletics not so much anymore and the AAU clubs marriage with large companies Nike Adidas Under Armour and branding so you have these kids who you know might start out playing on an AAU basketball team uh, with their buddies when they're eight, nine, ten years old. By the time they reach middle school, then kids who will play, have played on their township AAU squad with the kids from their middle school or whatever start getting noticed and recruited by large regional AAU teams. Um, and some kids travel, you know, hours for AAU practices. And these teams, you know, these and we have plenty of them in the Philadelphia area. Uh, recruit kids, and all, and they are all, like I said, married to a brand. And these, you have AAU coaches who are paid by Nike or Under Armour or Adidas, whoever it is. They're paid by these companies to, well, they're paid to one by the companies almost as a as a pseudo employee, but then also they're given you know all of the all of the gear, all of the swag that you know that their teams wear. So these guys are playing for a Nike team, and the whole idea is these companies not only, of course, uh, you know as you would in any uh, instance, you know in college athletics, high school athletics, wherever uh, you know you want the best players, best teams wearing your brands. Yeah. Um, so they want the AAU teams wearing these brands, going to AAU nationals, whatever it is, but also. They are buying in early on these prospects. They're sure. buying in early on these kids. So it create, creates this cycle where these kids, uh, frankly, I, it, from a very young age, aren't amateur athletics, yeah. am, amateur athletes anymore. But it's created this, it, it, and it's been that way for for a while now. Um, and, I mean, I think like, I think back to Sonny Vaccaro, right? Like a long, long time ago, these shoe companies. I mean, that's where it came from: the Adidas mm-hmm. and the Nike. That's where this FBI investigation came from. So it's trickling down to AAU. AAU is somewhat of a byproduct for sure, uh, but also it's you know it's the money at the NBA level. So kids want to get to the best schools. How do you get the kids to the best schools? Well, the best schools have all the money. How do they get the money? Right. The shoe contracts come in, and how do you get the shoe contracts? Well, you get the shoe contracts uh, if you're successful, and it just kind of bowls upon itself. But of course, we could get into this rabbit hole and talk all night about yeah. AAU, but Javon Quinterly to Villanova, absolutely huge. And, and I think it's one of those things where there will still be some facet of wait and see because, one, Villanova can't address it. They can't address it till April until he officially signs in that spring period. And then, two, um, we don't know whether he'll be eligible. Right? There's still an active investigation into his status, if in right. fact you know he's the player five that was involved there, uh, he very well could be deemed if the NCAA wants to make a statement completely ineligible from amateur athletics for accepting that fifteen thousand dollar. And and it, it appeared that it was more, but that's all that's been confirmed at this point. But Villanova brought in an outside legal firm. They did all of their due diligence by all accounts throughout this recruiting process. And uh, and that certainly is something that makes you feel better about this. And clearly, you know, let's say something happens and he's unable to play. Clearly a great get for Villanova. I think a worthwhile risk to take in a recruiting class where y- you may need three guys, you may need two guys. You don't know. Maybe Brunson stays. And not that there's any scholarship issue, but this is a time to take a shot on a guy like that. Yeah, absolutely. No matter when he comes in and contributes, I mean, I would be surprised to see him out on the floor next year uh, with the way that the NCAA has come down on, you know, amateur athletes accepting money in the, in the recent years here. But uh, no matter when he plays, if it's uh, two years from now, it'll absolutely be a great find for Villanova. Villanova basketball report here on BLS. That the big news starting your Wednesday, Javon Quinterly. Coming to Villanova via Hudson Catholic, one of the best pure point guards in the game. Maybe it's a, since the last time we talked to you, a a good way to come into this show. And a little bit of a uh, more more exciting thing to talk about than what happened last week. And that was on Wednesday night, a loss to St. John's. 
And St. John's an 0-11 team coming in. They were 11-13 and uh, on the year. And, uh, and now they continue to roll. A five-point loss to Xavier before they came into Duke. And Duke rolled right into Madison Square Garden, expecting a win. That clearly did not happen. Villanova then takes on a team with a little bit of momentum, and Shimori Pons once again has a good game, scoring 26 points. And the Red Storm had uh, four guys in double figures. It's a Red Storm team that we talked about on the first show, guys, is really athletic, and there will be time to turn the page and look towards this week's games, and we'll do it very shortly. But in terms of where Villanova struggled, they got a little bit tight. St. John's was really good on the closeout. And, uh, and I think got them just a half step ahead of where they wanted to go. Eight for 33 from three. Of course, not all of those were contested. But once you get a little bit tight and you don't quite feel comfortable, uh, they don't start to go down. And, and we'll talk about that on the other side of the equation in the Butler game this weekend. But in that particular game, I think a shocked home crowd as Villanova was starting to, and I hate to say look ahead because I'm not in the minds of those kids. They might have been locked in, focused, and St. John's just played really well, but nobody's doubting and nobody doesn't know about this the skid they have coming up here. Butler, Providence, Xavier, and an 0-11 team shocked them in the first of those four. I don't know about a shocked home crowd, but I know about a lethargic and quiet <laughs> home crowd. The Wells Fargo Center was dismal. It was embarrassing uh, last week for that St. John's game. And I, I feel for the players because you're the number one team in the country. You know you're one of the top teams in the country. You know you have a shot at a national championship again. Going for your fifth straight Big East regular season championship. And Wells Fargo Center is half full. And the people that are there, you know, it, it was a snoozer, honestly. It was a snoozer. And it was one of those games where the crowd didn't wake up until everybody with three, four minutes ago realizes, oh, wow, we're down eight points right now to St. John's. And the, we're running out of time. We might actually lose this game. And all of a sudden, everybody wakes up, and the Cats start to go on a little bit of a run towards the end of the game. But I, d- I don't understand it. That's a bit of a side note, me letting out some frustration. The students this year, I know it's tough, you know, heading down to the Wells Fargo Center uh, for all the games this year as the pavilion's being renovated. But you would still Do like they run to a see, bus? Uh, there is a bus. Yeah. There's a bus it's for students. It's not that there, tough to get down there's, there. There are two train lines that run from campus. It's not tough to get down there. You would think if you have the number one basketball team in the country, students would be falling over each other to get in to the games. Credit the students that are there. Uh, they, they've been they've been doing a good job. They were much better for Butler, of course. Butler was the one game of the year. Villanova seems to pick a game each year, uh, usually a Saturday or Sunday game at Wells Fargo where a lot of alums come back and t- there's tailgating. So that was the Butler game this year. That was a lot of fun. and That was sold out. Completely different <laughs> from the St. John's game earlier in the week. But yeah, that St. John's game, uh, I credit St. John's for playing really good defense. Really, really good defense. They didn't do anything crazy on offense. It wasn't like Shamori Shamori Pons is always going to get his buckets. He didn't go off crazy or anything. Credit their defense, Villanova. They forced Villanova into, or kind of lulled Villanova into playing a lot of one-on-one basketball offensively and uh, and shoot them up in this. Shoot them up, sleep in the streets, they say. Well, the Cats slept on slept in the streets after playing St. John's. Yeah, and credit to the St. John's supporting cast. We talk about Shamor Pons all the time. Obviously, uh, an amazing player. Uh, but, you know, guys like Marvin Clark and Justin Simon really had nice games, uh, really showed a lot of support to Shamori Pons, uh, you know, gave him the, the room to do his thing. Um, you know, we had to focus some of our guys on on uh, on Clark and Simon as well. So that really helped open the floor up for St. John's as a whole. And, and credit to them, you know, Villanova came out this one a little lethargic, as did the fans. And um, you know, missing Eric Pascal, Phil Booth, you can make all the excuses in the world you want for Villanova, but um, you know, you want to be the number one team in the nation. You got to win these games even without some of your best players. So. Credit to St. John's for a good win. And I, I think that's the real story of the game. I think that game immediately, the first game without Eric Pascal, showed just how valuable and undervalued he is as a player. Villanova had zero, and I mean zero, inside presence. I don't have the numbers. I don't know 
we could probably look those up, what exactly the numbers were in the paint versus shots taken outside. It seemed like they were settling for plenty of threes. St. John's, you know, like we've said, did a great job running the Cats off the three-point line and then a great job staying in front, not biting on shot, shot fakes. It was really, really good defensive effort from St. John's, and the Cats really hurt not having the inside presence of Eric Pascal. You guys remember, and I think I brought it up last show too, I said – that Villanova was out athletic, and I made that word up the first time they played St. John's. Listen, that's what I was talking about. I mean, it was a seven-point win, and I think a lot of people chalked that win up in Madison Square Garden as, well, they just came in and slept walked. And to some extent, they did. I, I don't know that they completely slept walked through this game or if St. John's just played well. I mean, Villanova hit eight of 33 three-point baskets. If you hit 14, you probably almost certainly win the game, and I totally understand that. But I'm not taken away from St. John's. I mean, I thought they played very, very well, and I think you have to give them credit for that. If they could somehow rip off some games, I think they'd probably have to win the, the Big East tournament. But let's say they win their next five, go into the Big East tournament, get to the final and lose, and they end up, what would that be, you know, 19, 20, and 15, and they have wins over Xavier, Villanova, Duke, and maybe a Xavier and a Villanova again? I don't know. Crazier things. Crazier things have happened. Uh, they're not going to the tournament. But <laughs> if, if that were to happen, it would be, at the very least, an interesting discussion and see where the value set of the NCAA tournament committee lies. But as we move to Butler, though, Completely different basketball game. Butler starts out very hot, and at some point you thought, okay, maybe this is the same. Also, maybe the same as what we saw on December 30th when Butler shot the lights out. They shot about 56% from the floor. They led by three and a half, which I thought was really, really good by Villanova. In fact, from the last, we'll say, eight minutes of the first half on, I thought the defense was significantly, we'll say, more successful. I don't know that the defense was better. And well documented into the second half, they went to a lot of zone. And we're going to get into on V's and O's in just a few minutes here about how Butler attacked the zone exactly the same way they attacked the man-to-man -man, and why I actually thought that had the opportunity to be successful, but the buckets just didn't drop. But the big thing, guys, correct me if you think I'm wrong here, it wasn't that Villanova turned up the screws on defense or necessarily that the zone was that, that much better. It's quite simply that they were better offensively. They were better offensively. They backed off the full court pressure when they did score, and they got into the half court. Butler's really, really good in transition, and they got a lot of transition to semi-transition buckets in the first 10 minutes of that game, including a lot of Keelan Martin step into threes in transition, some guy just stopping the ball and not flinging to him on the wing. Well, that didn't happen nearly as much in the second half. They had to run their half-court set, and I think it was Villanova getting those buckets and being able to set up in the half-court that was a bigger factor than, than some may think or realize. Yeah, and really the storyline of this game was Jalen Brunson and Dante DiVincenzo just taking over this game. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, there's, there's really not much else to it. If, if those two guys didn't show up, you know, we'd probably lose that game by 20 points. So they, they really just carried us in that game, and – this is really the time when Villanova needs to, to show their depth and, you know, flex their muscles a little bit. You know, we started this season probably about six deep with reliable guys, uh, you know, not counting the three true freshmen that we have right now. Um, now, right now we were forced to start one of those guys on a nightly basis without Phil and without Eric. Uh, so now you got to have guys like, uh, Colin and uh, Jermaine and Demir Cosby Roundtree getting meaningful minutes, which almost reminds me of what happened in 2016 when Daniel Cheffy went out and then Daryl Reynolds started getting meaningful minutes. And that's where you really started to see him blossom as a player, get comfortable in his role, feel a lot more confident. And all of a sudden, we had one more guy on our bench come tournament time when Daniel was then back. So I think this is really the time when Villanova – needs to show their depth that, you know, the freshmen need to step up. And we can, if we can get one or two more guys into that rotation, all of a sudden we have an eight or nine deep rotation and we're fully ready to make a run in, in March Madness. That's if, if it, that's if Phil does come back. But um, really need some of those guys to step up. Colin stepped up in the St. John's game. 
not so much in the Butler game. Jermaine getting a lot more meaningful minutes. Uh, Demir Cosby Roundtree seems to, to his minutes are declining recently, which is surprising yeah. to me. I'm not sure if you guys have any insight on that, but um, that's certainly disappointing to see. You would hope to see him get more meaningful minutes, especially without Eric out or with Eric out, because Demir is really our only true down low player, if you can call him that at this point. Uh, with Omari being more of a you know top of the key type guy setting up for a three, so we really just need to see what we what we have at this point. It's not quite Big East tournament time yet. It's not quite March Madness time. So, gotta you know see what our depth is right now. We're playing you know our top four guys 35 to 40 minutes a game right now. So, need to see a little bit more of what we have uh, in terms of depth. Yeah, well, first I want to get back to that that zone that they played against Butler, and that was that was phenomenal. That was, you know, I I honestly couldn't believe it. And zone, you know, was meant to run teams off the three point line, force them, uh, you know, to get or well, I guess force them to make you shoot over you, and uh, and that's exactly what happened. I, it was shocking that you'd go to a two three zone, and you know, let I guess let that's not the exact word I want to use, but you know. Kind of, kind of, guide bait, them bait, bait a towards. team into shooting threes when they had just torched you in the first half and have torched you the past three times they played you from three. It was an interesting decision, and it Butler got plenty of open looks, but what it did do was made Butler very uncomfortable. There was a lot of hesitancy. Um, they were very tentative, which was shocking to see on a lot of the three-point attempts in the second half. They did do a good job of getting the ball out of Keelan Martin's hands. And as you said, a lot of that had to do with making baskets, getting back in your half-court defense, not letting him pull up in transition. But but that zone, it just seemed to confuse the heck out of Butler. And even though they were getting open shots, they just looked like they were uncomfortable shots and couldn't knock them down. And Kevin, I completely agree. I think this could be a blessing in disguise if you do get a healthy Eric Paschal back soon, and if you do get a Phil Booth back in March, it could be a blessing in disguise now having these role players, these true freshmen, getting these minutes now, getting this experience right now, and be able to come off the bench in March and give you really meaningful minutes. I think this could help the Cats a lot come tournament time. Certainly, certainly agree. Tough to disagree there, especially with the way Colin Gillespie has begun to play, guys. A couple games ago, he was just completely out of it. And I think he would tell you that. I think Jay would tell you that. But he came back. He's been more consistent from three. He, I just think, has been more heady in terms of what he's done. Uh, I still think Demir Cosby Roundtree at times – is struggling defensively with positioning and assignments. I think that's actually part of the reason, even with a big man dearth, you're seeing more Jermaine Samuels than you are Demir Cosby Roundtree. It's not because of offense. It's just not. Jermaine Samuels has not showed us that. So for whatever reason, and hey, maybe we'll make that a V's and O's segment coming up, for whatever reason, Jay is uh, is trusting Jermaine Samuels. It would appear to be a little bit more versatile defensively than Demir. I'd like to see that change, though, because he's shown spurts. He's shown the ability to block the basketball. He's shown the ability to be a pretty good rebounder. And I think in small increments, he's shown the ability to be in the right spot. It's just not consistently enough. Yeah, and could it be potentially because of the way Jermaine played just before he got injured? Now, I know it was just one game, but maybe Jay's thinking, hey, this guy was playing well when he went out. Maybe we try to get that back real quick before you know before he forgets what that feels like. Try to get him some meaningful minutes in these games. You know we know Demir is sort of in the flow of things, and we can get him right back into it a little bit later. But maybe trying to recapture some of that magic uh, when he you know when he scored double digits right before he went out with a broken hand. Um, yeah. It's hard to say what that reasoning is right now. We can I agree. Guess at this point, I agree because I mean I make the comment about Roundtree, and I think it's because. I'm probably being a little bit hard on him because I think he has the possibility and he has the potential to be a really good defender. He's just not there yet. Uh, and that's when there's a golden opportunity, not that he's going to outscore Omari Spellman, but when there's a golden opportunity when there's a guy in Omari Spellman who right now is just guessing on, on high ball screens. It just kind of looks that way. He's just guessing on what to do uh, and, and where to position himself and how hard to hedge out on the offensive player. So, you know, that's that's my thought there. Yeah, if, if I may, my 
theory is that it just has to do with personnel and who you're playing. So when they played Seton Hall, Demir Cosby Roundtree played a lot of minutes. Not against, not in the second and half. Not in the second half, but early on in that game, and he played overall more minutes than he played against St. John's and Butler, mm-hmm. which are much more guard heavy teams. Maybe not when you look at the roster, but the way they play mm-hmm. is completely around the perimeter. St. John's, it's you know, Shamori Pons and the other guards driving to the basket, slashing, whatever, and Butler, it's essentially drive and kick and looking for those open threes. So you're playing guard-heavy teams, and I think that's where Jermaine Samuels playing more minutes helps you with that perimeter defense over Demir Crosby Roundtree, which serves you better against a bigger Seton Hall team. Well, it's a great segue to our next segment, which will come up right after the break, because if that's indeed the case, and, and I think you're right, in terms of what we're going to see on Saturday, Xavier, completely different style of basketball than anybody that we that Villanova has played in the last couple of weeks. So that, as well as that zone defense concept and how Butler attacked it exactly the same way as they attacked the man, is next here on BLS. V's and O's coming up on the Villanova Basketball Report. What's going on, folks? This is Bob Long from Bob Long Sports. We're live here at the Wells Fargo Center before each and every Philadelphia Soul home game. We record this now before Arena Bowl 30 and the Philadelphia Soul, the winningest team in Philadelphia. Bob Long Sports is your spot for live video pregame shows with Bob Long, Eric Nash, and Rob Stott. We even have the opportunity to talk with the AFL Commissioner, Scott Butera. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. You do a terrific job, and God bless all of you and the folks in Philadelphia. We wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Tune in before every home game for the Philadelphia Soul official pregame show on Bob Long Sports. Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation, our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want with financing you need. Dumpy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dumpy difference. You'll be glad you did. What does your character look like? Does it bounce back after each setback? Does it stand out by standing up? Does it make good on good intentions? Character is invisible until it's not. Only through action will the world know what it's made of, what you are made of. Find out how you can strengthen the character of your community alongside empowered veterans and families of the fallen at travismanion.org. People ask me why I'm giving up a year of my life to help kids. I say, who says I'm giving up anything? If kids who drop out are eight times more likely to end up in prison, do we open more prisons or mines? What's going on, folks? This is Bob Long from Bob Long Sports. We're live here at the Wells Fargo Center before each and every Philadelphia Soul home game. We record this now before Arena Bowl 30 and the Philadelphia Soul, the winningest team in Philadelphia. Bob Long Sports is your spot for live video pregame shows with Bob Long, Eric Nash, and Rob Stott. We even have the opportunity to talk with the AFL Commissioner, Scott Butera. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. You do a terrific job, and God bless all of you and the folks in Philadelphia. We wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. 
Tune in before every home game for the Philadelphia Soul official pregame show on Bob Long Sports. Welcome back, everybody. It's time for V's and O's here on the Villanova Basketball Report. And it is Bob Long with Kevin Long and Tom Trainer, And we're going to get you inside our studio here. And we're going to take a look at our whiteboard as we take a look at the Villanova Wildcats and what they were able to do against Butler to try to get them out of the rhythm. But why the Bulldogs decided to do exactly what they had done in the first half. I'm talking about man-to-man to zone concepts. So Villanova, when they started out in their man-to-man, it was business as usual for the opponents of Villanova in the last couple weeks. High ball screen where you start with the point guard up here and you bring the big up like this to set a screen and then you're either coming off the ball like this and then this guy's popping out or he rolls to the hoop as Omari Spellman has to either make the decision to come out and guard this guy right at the top of the key or sit back so that he can't drive by him. Now, unfortunately for Villanova, a lot of the times Omari Spellman was quite simply out of position. They were getting beat. Tom talked about it last week, the fact that in transition, Butler was able to set some of these ball screens as well and make things difficult. Listen, Villanova wasn't getting enough buckets in the first half to get back and set up in the half court, and when they were, Butler was still being successful. So what do they do? You're down to six guys. You go into zone. You try to stave off some of that fatigue by going into zone. Omari Spellman right here. You have your two wings out here, and then your two guards up here near the top of the, near the, top of the key. Point guard for Butler comes up the floor, hangs right here. Big in here, and what do you do? You come right up here and you set a ball screen. Now you make the Villanova make a decision. What are they going to do? Are they going to commit this defender over here, build a wall, and make the point guard make a decision? You know, in my estimation, it's unfortunate that that's not what they did. They brought Omari Spellman up here. He got caught in the middle, maybe even worse than what happened in the first half. Maybe a little bit of collapse here. Another guy out here, kick out. And fortunate for Nova, they just took a little bit, a little bit of that momentum away from Butler, forced him to execute in the half court, and they weren't quite as successful. But from my estimation, the zone did not perform well in the second half, and, and I think that that's a big issue. Now, what do I think Villanova could do? I don't see them doing this, but here's what I think could happen for Villanova to be successful against this zone. Right here, when this guy comes up, oh, excuse me, wrong color, comes up to set the pick, you can bring this defender right here. Build a wall and have this point guard make a decision because he's not going this way because the defender there, and now you're being guard by, guarded by another guard. You're not going this way because this guy is now switching, and he's not slipping because Omari Spellman, to some extent, is staying home. Now you have an athletic wing over here in Mikkel Bridges that can begin to creep up and prevent that pass and start to sort of try to stave in the middle of that gap. Uh, I do think that in that zone, if there is a weakness, that if there's a guy over here in the corner, that extra pass can be made. But that's where you utilize the length of a Mikael Bridges just to kind of get in the way there, get in the middle of that passing lane. You know, that's one thing that I think Butler could have been more successful against Villanova with because the defense had holes the way they were playing it. And quite frankly, I think Omari Spellman is still struggling against the zone. Now I'm going to erase all this because the zone goes away on Saturday against Xavier. And why? It's because they're going to have two bigs on the floor at all times. And what are they going to do? The offense in some ways runs through these bigs, like Sean O'Mara. The big guy is not the most athletic guy you'll ever see. He didn't have a great game against Villanova the first time. Had a great game, though, against Butler, setting up guys with assists and being very patient in the lane with his back to the basket. The other guy, Tyreek Jones, is a sophomore. He's going to be on this side. Or Karim Cantor it could be him as well. These guys that can play with their back to the basket. And it'll be a challenge for Villanova to go Omari Spellman here and not have Eric Paschal here. So I think you're going to see more time from Demir Cosby Roundtree. Now one guy I want to highlight for 
Xavier is Najee Marshall, a true freshman out of the greater D.C. area, put up double-digit points against Villanova and is coming into his own. He's a slashing forward that can either get into the teeth of the defense here in the middle or, as Villanova commits a guard, can stay out here, can hit a main mid-range shot, or can hit a bucket from beyond the three-point line. Clearly, we talk Xavier. We talk Trayvon Blewett. Possible All-American, some people are talking Player of the Year style numbers. Big 6'5", long, rangy. Xavier actually doesn't shoot a lot of three-point baskets, but he's really good at pulling up in transition. A lot of what we saw from Keelan Marshall against Butler. Coming up the floor, defense getting back, trying to stop the ball in transition. Bang, pop, fire. He's that good. And if you get out and try to guard him there, he will blow by you and has enough weapons around the hoop to finish. I mentioned those big guys, Cantor, Jones, Sean O'Mara. This is a really good Xavier team. They're ranked four for a reason, and they're going to provide a big, big challenge for this Villanova basketball team on Saturday. We're going to preview more of it and get into some of these concepts on the other side. But this is our V's and O's segment, and we'll have Tom and Kevin back on the desk in a few minutes to recap. Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation, our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want with financing you need. Dunphy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dunphy difference. You'll be glad you did. What does your character look like? Does it bounce back after each setback? Does it stand out by standing up? Does it make good on good intentions? Character is invisible until it's not. Only through action will the world know what it's made of, what you are made of. Find out how you can strengthen the character of your community alongside empowered veterans and families of the fallen at travismanion.org. People ask me why I'm giving up a year of my life to help kids. I say, who says I'm giving up anything? If kids who drop out are eight times more likely to end up in prison, do we open more prisons or mines? What's going on, folks? This is Bob Long from Bob Long Sports. We're live here at the Wells Fargo Center before each and every Philadelphia Soul home game. We record this now before Arena Bowl 30 and the Philadelphia Soul, the winningest team in Philadelphia. Bob Long Sports is your spot for live video pregame shows with Bob Long, Eric Nash, and Rob Stott. We even have the opportunity to talk with the AFL Commissioner, Scott Butera. We appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. You do a terrific job, and God bless all of you and the folks in Philadelphia. We wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate, appreciate it. Tune in before every home game for the Philadelphia Soul official pregame show on Bob Long Sports. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Villanova Basketball Report. Bob Long, Tom Trainer, Kevin Long. We just went through the concepts of Xavier. And first of all, anything stick out about Xavier to you guys as we get into this weekend full-scale, big-time matchup in the Big East? 
Well, one thing sticks out about this week is that Xavier isn't a great on-ball defensive team. They struggled against Villanova in their matchup at the Wells Fargo Center earlier this season. And that that plays into Villanova's favor because Xavier ha- is prone to bite on that shot fake. <laughs> Chris Mack seems to have never gotten his teams to, you know, get their heads wrapped around that when Villanova has lost at the Cintas Center in Cincinnati. It simply, in my mind, has been because Villanova just couldn't make shots on that day. It wasn't anything crazy that Xavier did defensively. They had great offensive showings in those matchups. That's right. But, but so the long and short of it is that Xavier that Villanova. It's sort of Xavier's kryptonite when it comes to offense versus defense. Villanova offensively, I mean, because Xavier likes to go to that one-three-one zone. However, Villanova, which we've talked about, you know, they t- sometimes fall into the trap of playing one-on-one basketball too often. But against one-three-one zone, you can't do that. And also against a one-three-one zone, Villanova has these shooters to shoot right out of that zone, forcing Xavier back into man-to-man defense. So I think if, if Xavier is going to get this big win for for their their own. Um, you know, Big East <laughs> standings help this weekend. Uh, it, for them, it's going to have to come on the offensive end. I think Villanova, unless they have just an abysmal shooting performance, I think Villanova is going to put up a lot of points. I think Xavier will have to have an outstanding offensive effort using some of those uh, principles you just mentioned. Uh, and uh, you mentioned it during V's and O's, Bob. Trayvon Blewett, um, you know, potential All-American, if not Player of the Year candidate, you know, we held them to held him to 11 points last time when he visited the Wells Fargo Center. So that's going to be uh, crucial in this matchup as well. He's he's the big playmaker for them. J.P. Mikura makes a lot of plays for them as well. Held him to five points when he came to Wells Fargo. Uh, going to be a big point for Villanova again. If, he, if they can hold those guys in check, they'll definitely have another good chance to win this game as well. Let's take a live look at the Big East standings here. In college basketball, Xavier a half game ahead of Villanova. Winners of eight straight. And you look at that. Winners of eight straight. That's the longest streak in the Big East Conference. Who was second? St. John's with three straight wins, including uh, a big win against Duke. And then, of course, the win against Marquette last week. But looking at the top there, Villanova 10-2. and They have the head-to-head hammer against Xavier. If they win again, Xavier presumably would drop one game in the loss column behind Villanova. We can talk about Providence as well. That's going to provide a tough matchup for Villanova here this week. But presumably, if they get to this weekend unscathed through this week, Villanova wins the game, they win the conference. Xavier would need Villanova to lose twice at that point, and uh, and Villanova would sit in the driver's seat. However, if Villanova loses that game, it's... At that point, very, very tough to come back and win the conference. And Xavier very well could be the number one seed in uh, in the big uh, in the well a number one seed in the NCAA tournament. The number one overall seed is not out of the question yet for these guys. The way they've played, the resume they have, and the fact that just everybody is losing. So that's what you have in the Big East and a long roll back to Creighton at eight and five, three games back of Xavier. If I'm Chris Mack and Xavier, after the after their past three games where they survived scares against Georgetown, at Butler, this past weekend, at Creighton, I got to be thinking, you're seeing the light. I think you're finally thinking you're crawling out of that dark tunnel that is the other nine teams in the Big East not named Villanova these past four seasons. And I think they're, think, they're thinking this is the first chance, real opportunity, this late in the season, I think that any team has been this close to really, I think, sitting in almost a better position than Villanova currently sits. If you look at the rest of the schedule for Xavier, I mean, after playing Villanova, they play, I think they get, what is it, all their biggest games still. So they have Seton Hall at home before they play Villanova at home this week. Then they play at Georgetown, then they get Providence at home, and then they play at DePaul. Conversely, Villanova still has to go on the road to Seton Hall, to Creighton, and they have this game coming up. Let's not forget this game earlier in the week at the Dunkin' Donuts Center against Providence, which has always been a tough matchup for the Wildcats. They've managed to come out of those games at the Dunkin' Donuts Center unscathed, but it hasn't been without their share of bruises and cuts uh, so, I mean, if, if I'm Xavier Musketeers, I think I'm sitting pretty right now. I mean, obviously, you have the de- four-time defending Big East champs in Villanova. Can never count them out. But Xavier has a great shot this year. 
Yeah, and, and this definitely has um, you know a big effect on who is going to be the regular season champion of the Big East. It means a lot to these kids. Um, some people are taking that a step further and saying that this game is going to be for a number one seed in March Madness, which I think is, is crazy to think. Now, winning the re regular season title in the Big East, certainly a huge accomplishment, something that each one of these kids can carry with them the rest of their lives. But to say that, that this is for, for a number one seed in the NCAA tournament is uh, a little bit over the top. This was a headline from VU Hoops, actually, I saw earlier today. Um, you know, these teams are either going to meet in the Big East tur tournament again or if they lose early, then they're almost assuredly not going to be a number one seed. So to say that this game alone determines the number one seed is a little bit over the top. Um, you know, if they meet in the NCAA t in the uh, Big East tournament, excuse me, again, you would have to think that that game would carry much more weight and would be in turn for the number one seed overall. But obviously, a lot on the line here for the regular season title. Well, let's let's, let's look at that real quick, right? Right in front of you on your screen here, you have the AP and the USA Today top twenty-five. Virginia, you're telling me they're not losing again before the end of the year? I mean, they could lose. They could lose in a couple days at Miami. Then they got to go through the crazy tournament that is the ACC tournament. Michigan State, I contend they're not playing good basketball right now. They had a good win against Purdue. Before that, they were playing pretty atrocious basketball by Spartan standards. Villanova, Xavier, Cincinnati. Are we putting an American Athletic Conference team as number one? I don't know. My apologies to all my, my Cincinnati folks, but... Are we putting them as the number one seed uh, in a respective region? I don't know. Purdue, I think, has a legitimate shot to be number one, uh, a number one seed on that top line, especially if they go win the Big Ten tournament. Really respect that team and the and the work that they put in and the schedule that they have. Texas Tech, listen, not only do I think that they're not going to be a one seed, I think they somehow give up this Big 12 and Kansas still at least gets a share of the regular season title again. I don't see Texas Tech being a number one seed. I don't see an Ohio State being a number one seed. Gonzaga, there's no shot that Villanova with the same or fewer losses unless there's some cataclysmic injury that we don't know about yet and there's a guy that they won't be with in the NCAA tournament. You know, Villanova with, say, four losses will not be ranked behind Gonzaga. Then you're looking at Auburn, Clemson, Duke, and Kansas. I don't see it, guys. I, I think that with a win or a loss here, they're still in an unbelievably good spot to line up as a number one seed and just play their opening rounds in Pittsburgh and potentially to go to Boston. How much weight do you put in the early top 16 that the selection committee released this Sunday? Tough to say because it's the first time they've done it. And, well, and I ask because there's a enormous discrepancy between their top 16 and the six, top 16 you just saw in the rankings right there. Michigan State is, was a three seed this Sunday. That was after Virginia lost, after Villanova had lost, after Michigan State had won at Purdue, and the selection committee still put Michigan State on the three line. Yeah. Uh, so there's a huge discrepancy, and then they still have teams, you know, teams that are flailing right now, Duke and Kansas sitting on the two line. Yeah. So there's a huge discrepancy. So I, I don't know if that Agreed. tells me that the selection committee isn't being honest or truthful. They just want a story to tell because people ha are, you know, are are talking about that, or if it's that the rankings don't mean, I mean, they mean something, but very, very little. So I, I don't know what. What to take at this point, you know, for – and like we've said, so much still has to happen. There's still five to six games each team has to play in the regular season and then the conference tournaments. I think it's still too early to be talking about number one seeds. Tom, when you talk about that top 16, listen, when there's a model that produces ratings and money and interest, you follow it. And so when the college football playoff a few years ago started putting – a muck of crap out there every single Tuesday, and people like us ate it up. Basketball says we need to get in on this action. You're going to drop – no, I'm not even going to do it. You're going to drop TCU from three <laughs> to six on the last weekend of the season after they win a game by 52 points? That's what that is. That's what that is. It's bull crap. Yep. Absolutely agreed. We already learned our lesson from college football. <laughs> it's the same exact thing. Everyone loves it. We're still going to watch it every so, week up until the tournament. 
And uh, <laughs> so then you're saying, but it means nothing. So they're not going to release this every week. I think this was a one-time thing, and then okay. they're, and then they're coming right. back on Selection Sunday. So it's right. not like the college football playoff in that regard. Yeah, they're so doing you, it wrong. So you're saying, <laughs> so you're saying that at this point in time, and I'm sorry if we're going off on a tangent too much. You'd put like more tangents. more weight in the actual rankings themselves. I don't know that I do that either, right? If you're asking me what I put the most weight in, it's what we never. Not never, but what we don't put up on the screen here for our viewers to see, and that's RPI. RPI and strength of schedule, I would look at those rankings uh, in addition to the record, and I think that's how you get a decent idea of where your top 16 is going to be. And, oh, by the way, Michigan State, in terms of their strength of victory, is not very good. So if you're asking why they're lower, that's why. They don't have the body of work and the quality of wins that Villanova and Xavier has. And it doesn't just need to do with the conference, because there's people out there saying, but the Big Ten is better than the Big East. Well, we can, one, talk about that when there's 14 teams versus 10. How good are those bottom four, bottom five teams that Big East teams don't need to play? Yes, DePaul understood. But even if you say the Big Ten is a little bit better than the Big East, it's about how they've won the game. It's about the fact that Villanova crushed Xavier by 24 points. It's about the fact that they solidly handled Creighton. It's about the fact that they solidly handled Gonzaga. They came back and beat Tennessee when they were in foul trouble. It's about the fact that every time that there was something in the non con and they had a decent non-conference schedule, they rose to the occasion. And that's why Villanova, that's why Xavier, look at Butler. I mean, Butler's not going to be on this, but... Butler's going to be a decent seed in this tournament. They had as difficult of a strength of schedule in the non-conference as anybody, and they handled it very, very well. So if you're asking how we should do it, you know, if you're looking at a Joe Lenardi or, man, back in the day I loved my bracket breakdown. I love Joe. He's a, he's a friend of mine, but I'll go toe-to-toe with you. Uh, I don't do it anymore. You do a better job than I do now. But I loved doing the bracket breakdown and going through all 68. You know, that's a big part of the way I did it, understanding the big wins, the key losses, RPI, strength of schedule, how you're playing in your last 12, even though that dropped out about 7 to 10 years ago of the official criteria. I still think it's a part. Uh, so if you really want to get a top four seed or top uh, the whole 68, that it's a trying exercise. Anybody? No. no. It's on an yeah, island. I think you you pretty well summed it up there, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it's I agree. It's a lot about well, you talk about RPI, but what makes up RPI is mostly strength of schedule and how you do against those opponents. You know whether or not you're playing a you know cake schedule for you know two out of three games, and then you get up against a good team and you can beat them. Well, a lot of teams can do that, but if you're playing the best teams night after night constantly challenging your kids over and over then you know that that's a team that's that's tested and ready for march all right it is time for dun, 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 dun. we need some music <laughs> the pick em challenge tom take it away my friend who do we have and how did we do last week well after a huge week for kevin with plus he was in the plus 30s last week jumped him up into first place after his first uh, his first second place uh, finish, first time he found himself uh, in second place behind Bob. He quickly rebounded and had seven and a half points coming into this week to Bob's negative four. However, not to be outdone, Bob had a huge week himself. We'll get to that. These were the matchups. Kevin picked Memphis over a nine and a half point favorite Wichita State. Didn't work out quite so well. Wichita State ended up crushing Memphis by 20, 85, 65. Lost 10.5 points there. Then he picked Florida State over a three-point favored Virginia. Was actually pretty close on this one as the Cavaliers barely squeaked by the Seminoles 59 to 55. Negative one points for Kevin on that one. And then his positive score of the week, which... Kept in it, kept him uh, in it this week was Marquette over a six and a half point favorite Seton Hall. Marquette won eighty eight to eighty five. Can't figure out this Marquette team. They are up and down all over the place. But a good win for the Golden Eagles in that game and a plus nineteen and a half points for Kevin, giving him a plus eight for the week, leaving him with plus fifteen and a half overall. So in positive figures, starting to look 
More and more like the PGA Championship and not the U.S. Open. <laughs> we are. And Bob came negative four into the week. He picked a hot Penn Quaker team over the a four-and-a-half-point favorite Princeton at Princeton. And the Quakers came in strong for Bob with an 82 65 win, a Penn Quaker squad, which I believe now sits 7-1, and one, tied with Harvard at the top of the Ivy League. That'll be fun. Everybody in the Philadelphia area, if you get a chance, get down to the pleasure. Catch these Penn Quakers as they go for that Ivy League championship run. It's great to have that team back in the hunt in the Philadelphia area. It's exciting. So Bob got a plus 31.5 points off of that game. Huge points for Bob there. And then he picked Tennessee over a 1.5-point favorite, Kentucky a team that is crumbling right now in the SEC play. Tennessee, who is not crumbling, they are surging and looking better for Villanova each week as they propel themselves to the top of the SEC. They won 61-59 to over Kentucky, 13.5 points for Bob. And then he, in his Big East game, he picked Xavier over Butler, a game which went to overtime in Hinkle Fieldhouse. Butler was actually favored, as Bob, I believe, had told me before the show. He thinks Vegas was looking for a little bit of... Hinkle Magic, or they love Hinkle Magic, I believe he said. They were three-and-a-half-point favorites, but Xavier won in overtime, 98-93, plus 18-and-a-half for Bob, plus 59-and-a-half. No, I'm sorry, plus 63-and-a-half for the week. He now stands at plus 59-and-a-half to Kevin's plus 15-and-a-half. What do you got for this week? I got the Terps of Maryland, plus two against Nebraska. I think that one's tonight. I think it's a late tip out there in Omaha. Timmy Miles doing a great job with that Nebraska team. Mark Turgeon, maybe my least favorite coach in college basketball. But I think the script's turn as Maryland is on the outside looking in and they need a big one tonight. Providence, plus ten tomorrow against Villanova. Not that I don't think Villanova's going to win the game. It's a high line there. It's a place where Creighton and Xavier and Butler have all gone down this year, and it's a team with length, Diala, and you got Bullock, and you got really Kyron Cartwright is their only scorer, their only player in their top eight that's under the uh, the wingspan of, of six foot six foot six, I should say. Uh, that's tough. So I think they're going to keep it close. And then finally, Clemson plus two and a half over Florida State. They're talking. Florida State, seminal home magic. I don't see it. Give me the number 11 Tigers to go on the road and win a game they're supposed to in a game that they are not favored in. I'm going to try to reap some benefit there. All right. So uh, for me this week, starting in the Big East, I have Seton Hall plus 5.5 over Xavier. Now, you know, I like the way Xavier's been playing. I like the way Seton Hall's been playing. You know, last week they had a slip up to Marquette, but in the past four games, Xavier has not won a game by more than five points. They've been keeping it close. I like Seton Hall to keep this one close, maybe sneak it out, uh, maybe get me a 10 pointer there. So I'm going to go with Seton Hall uh, with the line there. Next one, I have Nevada plus one over Boise State. Uh, both 21 teams already this year. Nevada ranked number 24 games at Boise State. Both teams playing really well. Uh, not really sure why this line is in uh, Boise, in Boise State's favor right now. I guess just because it's at Boise State. It's tough to win on the blue floor, though. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I like the Wolf Pack in this one uh, to at least cover. And then my final one, this one was a real shocker to me. I, I did a little digging for this one, trying to get a really good matchup. I have Mississippi State plus one over Vanderbilt. Now, Vanderbilt right now has nine wins on the season. Mississippi State is 18 and 7. It's at Vanderbilt, but I still can't fathom why a nine win Vanderbilt team is favored Vegas. in this game. Vegas. So <laughs> they know something. I'm going with it. I'm going with Mississippi State well over done. Vandy. Hey, there you go. You hey, got, listen. You got to go big. That's a low let low downside pick there. I like yeah. that. Absolutely. I've I've learned my lesson. <laughs> Don't give yourself a chance to, to be upset and lose 10 points. And and I like that Seton Hall pick. As you said, Xavier's been, you know, walking a thin line recently, and Seton Hall is a team that needs a win uh, if they want to, at this point, it's not just seeding for the NCAA tournament, but they need to make sure they get in the NCAA tournament sitting at 17-8 and eight right at the moment. So I like that pick. I also like your Big East pick, 
the Providence Villanova pick because Ed Cooley and those Friars in the Dunkin' Donuts Center always tough. Let's not overlook this matchup tomorrow night. It's a good pick. That's right. It'll you be always an interesting week. You always got to get those Friars going at the Dunkin' Donuts Center. <laughs> Otherwise, you can't get that big and toasty. <laughs> Probably no Eric Pasco again tomorrow. I, I yep. would like that pick as well. All Let's right. You got some trivia for us, Tom. Yes, we do. So first, we will stick with the weekly theme. I have two questions for you. So the game theme, I should say. It is another Xavier week, not to look over Providence game this week. But last year, Chris Mack took Xavier to their third ever regional final in the NCAA tournament. The two previous times Xavier made an Elite Eight, who were the head coaches? I got you. Give me that pen. (laughs) <laughs> How much time do we have? I'll give you tw- another 20 seconds. Have you got this? No. <laughs> no? I don't even have a prayer. Uh, ah. Should we give him a head pop? 10 um, seconds. I mean, sure. <laughs> Arizona. Okay. For one. Five, four, three. Uh, all right. If you had to make a guess, Kevin, if you had to make a guess. So it was 2004 and 2008 when Xavier made the Elite Eight. Two separate co- head coaches. Who were they? They both moved on to big time programs back when Xavier was not in the Big East and a big time program yet. I uh, I got nothing for you. That would be Sean Miller is the easy one. And Thad Mata. Thad Mata, yep. Thad 2004. Mata. Yeah, I believe mm-hmm. Thad Mata had two NBA draft picks on that team. Mm. From that Xavier, that mid-major Xavier squad. And then that Sean Miller team, that was a fun team with um, the little guy. Five foot seven. Uh, was it Lavender? What was his name? 24. Jordan. Uh, who transferred from Oklahoma. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Yeah, right I'm blanking. Here we go. This is going to be a blast from the past going down memory lane. How are you going to search this? I'm very interested, unless you already have it searched. I had it up. Drew Lavender. Oh, there you Lavender go. About five foot seven. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the original Isaiah Thomas, if you will. I, my, fav- my favorite Xavier player going back is two Holloway. Two big, Holloway. Big fan of two. That's a good one. Two for three. That's a good one. The the two uh, Thad Mata players that were drafted in the NBA just um, – for the sake of conversation, were Lionel Chalmers, who was taken 33rd by the Los Angeles Clippers, and Romaine Sato, mm. who was taken by the Spurs. Don't and remember much about Sean his Sean Miller had Derek Brown, who was a draft pick. How about it? 40th overall. By the Charlotte Bobcats during the dark ages there in Charlotte. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. So, and you, you got one more, don't you? Because we said before the show, Tom, that maybe Kevin would ask for that second pick or the second uh, – <laughs> Trivia question in an effort to come back, but maybe not just to stop the bleeding. No, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, whatever you got, it's all right. Not all right, shame. cue it up. So, if, if as we predict and as Yahoo Sports and all of the uh, inside sources have said, Javon uh, Quinterly chooses to come to Villanova tomorrow when he officially commits, that would make three top 50 recruits coming to the main line next year. There has been one other recruiting class with three top 50 recruits to join Jay Wright on the main line. Which recruiting class was it? Oh, man. I'm down to two. I'm down to two. Then we could easily segue into a conversation of whether this recruiting class with Cole Swidel, Brandon Slater, and Clearly would be the best recruiting class Jay Wright has ever brought yeah. up. Yeah. I can't decide if you're tricking me or not. I think you're trying to trick me. I, I don't know. Any guesses, Kev? Yeah, uh, pick. You go I'll, first. I'll give, uh, you need a few more seconds no, to think no, about it? I mean, got it? I, have, right. I have one guess. All right. Um, actually, now I'm thinking about, think about more. But I'm going to go with my original one. I believe it was 2003. I'm going to say Randy Foy, Alan Ray, and Curtis Sumter. Yeah, so that was going to be my thought. Again, I think you're tricking us. So I'm going to go with the Wayans class and Dom Cheek. Yeah. 
Yeah. That would have been. That was it. 2009. Muftal Yaru yeah, I was told the you 11th were us. ranked recruit in the country. Yeah. Mo Cheeks, 21st, and Malik. <laughs> I'm not Mo Cheeks, sorry. Dominic Cheek. Dominic Cheek. Dom Cheek. And Malik Waynes, 23rd. And then they had Isaiah Armwood, who also came in yeah. and was 63rd ranked. That was a hot recruiting class. And then you guys didn't mention that 2002 recruiting class that you brought up. Their top recruit was Jason, Jason Frazier. Frazier. So the top all recruit American. in both of those classes was a big man yep. coming to uh, guard you, if you will. That's right. So mm-hmm. would this be the best recruiting class that Jay has ever brought in with Javon Clinnerly with He's a 26th. Ranked recruit overall, the seventh best point guard. Brandon Slater, 48th best recruit overall, 13th small forward. And Cole Swider. Is that my Swider? Yep, that's story? correct. Yeah. yeah, 34th recruit nationally, 11th power forward. Let me throw this out there. Would it be his best recruiting class? You're saying, I think I know what you're saying. So what I'll say then is that 2000, whatever it was, 9? 2009. That was not his best recruiting class. It was his best statistical recruiting class. Clearly, that didn't go. go well. You had two guys leave early for the NBA, and they neither of them went to the NBA. I mean, uh, Wayans bounced around D-leagues. Cheek went to Europe. He knew he was going to Europe. He had his own family reasons. Totally understand that. I mean, that was the dark age for Villanova. And really, Muftal Yaru was the only guy of that group because Zeke Armwood transferred to George Washington. So that was not a great recruiting class, as it turned out. Uh, You know, I'd argue one of the best recruiting classes was the Jenkins and Hart recruiting class. I'd argue that clearly that recruiting class that you talked about, Jason Frazier and Curtis Sumter and Randy Ford and Alan Ray. We're not talking about, you know, what they ended up producing at oh. Villanova what their legacy was so wh- at Villanova. We're talking, co- we're talking about coming in because you, I think you could definitely say that Hart and Jenkins would have you know, run for their money. You could even say that uh, the recruiting class with Dante Cunningham and Dwayne Anderson, Shane those Clark, guys that came in very, very unheralded. Those, none of those guys were ranked in like the top 200. So I'm sorry, what, what, class. what is the- so, I, so, I, so, I, this was, uh, so the question was you know, re- recruiting rankings. Right, that was the that was the question. Yeah, the just the only time where they day had three. One when they step on campus. Yeah, this would be the first time, the first, the only the second time ever that Jay Wright will brought in three top fifty recruits. The other time was two thousand and nine. No, I guess it is. And I mean, then, so do you do you think this would be? I mean, because because he had four guys in that two thousand two class. He had Frazier, mm-hmm. Foy, Sumter, and Ray. It, That's quite a class. It, it probably is the best recruiting class. It's probably very similar to what we got in 2002 and 2009, but it's definitely the best recruiting class that has just stepped right into a great situation. You think about where the team was in 2002, and you know a couple of years leading up to 2009, obviously we you know made the Final Four that year, but we weren't necessarily in the best place as a program. You know, struggled in 2011, 2012 years struggled leading up to 2002 and then really you know got a lot of players in that class and got much better this team step stepping into a national championship team who's going to compete on a national stage every single year and it seems like that these recruiting classes are just going to keep building on themselves and we're going to start consistently seeing these classes year after year instead of once every seven to ten years like we've been seeing in the past yeah i yeah i and i'm not trying to I don't think I quite understand the question still, but I guess what I'm saying is, or maybe maybe here's the way I'll answer. I, I think I'm answering it incorrectly. I feel bad about it. But if you're saying wh- who's most ready to come in and play day one, I don't think it'll be these guys, and I don't I think, think that's what you're I think asking. The question but, is most most heralded, the most. Yeah. Then yeah, like I, on I, guess. Then, then I, I don't the know that it, I don't know that it is. Then in that case, I think it was the point you were making where that Yaru Cheeks Wayne okay. class might have been the most heralded recruiting class that I Jay see. Wright ever brought in. Because they're coming off a of Final Four, out. and they're thinking, now we're really taking the I next mean, step. They were all we're... top 25 recruits. Right. Okay. I think that's fair. It's good discussion. And great trivia questions. Way to go, Tom. You got it. Kev? Here to please. <laughs> uh, I'm just glad I chose one of the options that was somewhat <laughs> close this time. Yeah, <laughs> nah, that was a heck fair. of a class, man. I I just thought this guy is sneaky over here, man. He's trying to trick us. That's what I. But how? How about the? So isn't two, that something? Two thousand two, they brought in Frazier, Foy, Sumter, Ray, and then the next year they brought in Nardi and Sheridan. Yeah. 
Wow, what a way to set and up then, the program. Uh, and then a great dynamic duo would have been uh, Corey, the Corys, Corey Fisher and uh, Corey, Corey Stokes. Stokes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're exactly right. There was another guy in that class, wasn't there? Not that I remember. I don't Maybe know there was a Mr. Corey Stokes. Hmm. I don't know. I feel like um, – Was Reggie Reddy in that? No, I think he came in alone just about. I was mm-hmm. thinking like Bala- – no, Bilal. No, Bilal was too early. I'm thinking, uh, you know who I'm thinking of? Who am I thinking of? I don't know who I'm thinking of. <laughs> We're supposed to be Frank. The experts. Tweezy. Oh, Tweezy? No, no, or was no. he with, he was with Cheek, maybe. What? No, no, I thought he came When did Antonio Pena come in? in? Was Pena. he in that class, or is he early? Now we're just tossing no, out I random know. Villanova yeah. names. <laughs> House of Pena, stand up. Big fan of that. <laughs> He may have come in with Corey Fisher. Somehow that rings a bell. I thought Stokes and Fisher were uh, solo. Yeah. I mean Tweezy. 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 Twenty ten. Yeah. No, I mean Fisher and Sto- love the guy. Was an assi- grad assistant for a while. Mm-hmm. Stokes and Fisher did come in alone. <laughs> oh wow. Oh, Ouch. I see. I see. I see what you did there. It's rough. I mean, uh, we'll let it go, Frank. <laughs> no, no, I, I love Frank. <laughs> It'll be okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> We should just get out of here. Yeah, let's <laughs> sign off. <laughs> this is fun though. I, I like just just chatting and, and yeah. evoking the Villanova memories. And honestly, what I should have been doing is is asking for more comments on Facebook because that you know this is where this stuff gets fun. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, did any of the fans help us out? In fact, you know what? Uh, we have Dave Dave Buzzard saying uh, Jason Frazier class he had initially had Terry saying twenty sixteen. <laughs> And uh, and he is enthralled with the move to Yaru and uh, and that class, the fact that it was them. So there yeah. you go. Move Yaru, the eleventh ranked recruit in the country. And then last comment from Dave before we get out of here. Uh, any comments or thoughts on St. Bonnie's chances on getting into the tournament, coming into the A10 conference uh, strong, and into that conference tournament conversation strong, and that team needs more than Rhode Island. So unless. Bob Lanier is kind of – I'm just kidding. But unless Bob Lanier is coming back, I don't see their, them doing anything deep in the tournament. But I think it's a great story that a team from upstate yeah. New York, and I know why you're saying it, Dave, Buffalo Pride, yes, sir, would love to see the Bonnies in it. Yeah. You know, what? Western New York, upstate New York. There's would, some would good people to, and good schools up there. would love to see it after years of being, you know, a pushover squad in the A-10 conference. Good yeah. to see the Bonnies back. In yes, sir. Mm-hmm. This is a good show, boys. Really enjoyed it. We're going to post fun. it up later. We're going to have the V's and O's segments cut up separately and posted as well. Things to look for going into the matchup against Xavier and things to move forward thinking about because, hey, Xavier will run a high ball screen as well. It's not that they don't do that, uh, but I wanted to focus on something else. That said, you're going to see more of that from us and from all the teams that play Villanova because right now that's their weakness and it's it's the hot play in college and the NBA and Omari Spellman and I'm not saying he's not being told what to do and being hold tell, told to, to you know go halfway but it's not working at the moment and uh, and I think it'll be interesting moving forward so you'll see that on V's and O's and you'll also see uh, of course the uh, the things to watch for against Xavier so we got a lot of good stuff coming up this week Providence tomorrow. Xavier on the road at the Sintas Center on Saturday. And we're going to come back next Tuesday talking about a different team. You know, whether they've won two and are reeling things off, maybe Pascal's back, or if they've taken a step back, we'll have a lot to evaluate and hope that you are all back as well. Thanks for making us a home here on Tuesday nights. And we'll be back soon talking Villanova basketball here on the Villanova Basketball Report.